So welcome everyone. Welcome to this session on unlocking the full potential of your scrum through organizational design. Uh, this is a topic very dear to my heart. I've become very interested in organizational design in recent years. And I just think in Australia, in New Zealand, it's a very immature topic. It's not really something that has been discussed a lot in the agile community till quite recently. You know, we're now over two decades into this whole agile movement and we're starting now you know, really to get serious about trying to understand what are those things we should be looking at in the structures, you know, a whole lot of uh, elements that Dennis is going to take us through. But uh, just to briefly introduce Dennis, and he can say more himself in a moment. Uh, Dennis has got a very interesting background. He's worked in a number of financial services organizations, at one point head of PMO slash senior agile coach. It'd be interesting to understand how that worked. And yeah, for BMW Group, I guess, with uh, some of their less adoption more recently as well. That was one of the exciting ones, I guess, for the uh, less approach in, in Europe. So yeah, he's very well connected with that large scale Scrum Less community and has obviously a passion, a very big interest in this topic as an organizational architect. Has anyone heard of an organization architect before? You're about to meet one. <laughs> so I'd like to introduce to you, uh, Dennis Sunny. Over to you, Dennis. Let's welcome Dennis. Um, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Um, just maybe answering your question. Uh, um, I had to invent uh, the organizational architect, mostly because just a few people around the world I could find uh, on LinkedIn with the same title. Uh, because other titles are unfortunately quite uh, different. And uh, this is quite specific uh, aspect, which uh, touch something from HR, from uh, CEO responsibilities, etc. But that is quite quite a huge topic. So <laughs> let's maybe uh, keep this for, uh, um, yeah, chatting afterwards. Um, I, I suggest that, that uh, I will share my screen, but also uh, I hope that, uh, guys, you can share the link to uh, Miro Board so uh, everyone who participates actively or maybe want uh, to see what, what we are talking about directly from Miro, they can do it, okay? Is it possible? We can yeah, start that into the chat. Do that, yeah. Okay, cool. Got that one. So now I'm sharing my screen. Please let me know if you can see my screen. All good? Okay. So um, just briefly about uh, what I, I will try to, um, to do here for you. Um, first of all, um, please look at this as something that uh, I would like to share because I'm not selling obviously anything, yeah? Um, I had a lot of problems uh, in, in my practice, um, uh, coaching uh, various companies uh, about Scrum, Agile, etc. And I discovered that um, a lot of um, challenges lead me to one single uh, gap. And this gap is in a specific tool, the specific tool which facilitates uh, the discussion, the collaboration, and the uh, discovery of um, root causes of various problems. So in this session, I will try to help you to learn about Orca Canvas. So this is uh, the tool that um, together with Ralph, uh, we invented. And uh, uh, this tool is uh, to help people identify root causes in the organizational design. Uh, those root causes which uh, are in the way towards unfolding the full potential of your Scrum or even in general Agile. Honestly speaking, you could use this uh, tool even uh, for broader uh, needs, but here we're speaking about Scrum, so this is why I mention it exactly. Um, in, the, in our agenda, we will start uh, from just a very brief uh, introduction into, uh, guys, who am I and uh, what I'm doing here. Uh, then I will, uh, in order to introduce the tool itself, I will try to um, give you two other tools. By the way, you can use them separately, even without Orca Canvas, and maybe you already know them, which were foundation for, uh, for the creation of Orca Canvas. Then the Orca Canvas itself, so I will explain what is this, how you can use it, and we definitely will practice. 
using the tool. Yeah. Um, after the practicing, I will sh share some uh, real example from a real company. Yes, of course, it's a little bit simplified for the sake of uh, uh, this this event. But anyways, it will show you how a specific company with ex <laughs> approximately the same exercise, uh, what they ended up with. Um, and in the end, uh, after quite short, uh, I, I always value feedback from you guys. Uh, so uh, after short uh, uh, feedback uh, questions, we will have Q&A for those who are interested, of course. Okay. So let's go straight uh, into it. So, yeah. So here uh, um, are the authors. Um, so first of all, uh, Ralph uh, is uh, my, co uh, my collaborator in creating the Orca Canvas. And uh, probably some of you, or may maybe even many, uh, know him by the uh, book, uh, The Professional Product Owner. So he was the co-author of that book. Uh, he is a professional uh, Scrum trainer from scrum.org and uh, some uh, other um, uh, organizations too. Um, he himself uh, presents he, as a change agent <laughs> predominantly, but essentially he's a trainer, coach, consultant, and author. And by the way, you always can use this uh, link. It's clickable, so you can open uh, um, uh, these links in your browsers. Uh, so about me, um, yeah, uh, Ralph is uh, Switzerland-based, and I am in Portugal, but uh, I am in the process of uh, moving to Australia. I admire the country, and this is my dream, dream country for living. Um, so I'm a certified trainer of uh, creating agile organizations. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I uh, also was on the path towards uh, professional scrum trainer. I did not finish it. Uh, because yeah, there are some reasons for that. So I'm PSM3 certified, uh, also candidate less trainer. And yeah, I have uh, some quite nice experiences in huge corporations, but uh, important that I do not that much like <laughs> corporations because uh, yeah, um, they are not that much dynamic sometimes, quite challenging yet. Um, and I also have a, a lot of experience in uh, small organizations, startups, etc. So. Very briefly about me, if you have any questions, uh, I will, uh, of course, admire having connections with you in LinkedIn or uh, wherever uh, you want. So next, uh, just one word probably that uh, the topic of organizational design is crucial from my perspective. And this is one of the reasons why I uh, put on pause uh, my path towards the professional scrum trainer. Uh, because the organizational design is quite often exactly the um, source of root causes when uh, Scrum is so hard to actually unfold its potential. Yeah? And this is why uh, right now I am focusing on uh, training exactly about the organizational design, unfolding your potential in terms of agility. Um, you can find uh, the course using this link. So I will not spend that much time on explaining uh, about the course. You can always read it. Now the foundation, as I promised. So first tool, which was uh, the, the first foundation for OK Canvas is the five-star model um, invented by uh, Jay Gilbert. Um, I, I trust that some of you definitely uh, heard about this or even used uh, this, this model in practice. This model, essentially, it gives you a um, view on the organizational design. And the organizational design starts from the business strategy, which is the most important to, yeah, it's, it's a driver for everything else in the organizational design. So the structures, processes, rewards, and people should be aligned in a way that supports uh, a continuous improvement towards your strategy. Um, now, just a couple of words about these different elements. Structure incorporates not just uh, organizational chart, but uh, this represents all the roles, responsibilities, authorities, uh, everything which uh, is anyhow related to the distribution of powers in the company. Processes, uh, not only those processes um, introduced by and maybe um, defined by the management, but speaking about Scrum teams, for example, 
those are self-managing. And of course, some processes are defined, invented, or uh, agreed upon uh, by self-managing teams. So any processes are uh, involved into this um, element or this category of uh, the organizational design. Uh, rewards actually stand not just for rewards, but for everything uh, inside the organizational design, which anyhow impacts the motivation of people. And speaking about the motivation, I always encourage thinking about both the power of motivation, how uh, strongly people are motivated, but also not less important, the direction of the mo mo motivation. People might be quite motivated, but not for something that is actually needed for the company. So every aspect uh, impacting this type of motivation are inside this uh, category. So for example, many companies have performance management, career development, uh, somehow they manage salaries. Uh, even whenever you uh, maybe worked with uh, some startups, maybe they don't have anything like that, but they at least have informal recognition, even within the team or by the CEO, those aspects quite significantly impact motivation of people too. And lastly, but not the least important, of course, uh, the people. Uh, this is about not just the exact people who work, of course, it's important, but this is about the kind of people that we hire and develop, what type of um, behavioral patterns we seek in uh, in the people, um, what mindsets, what type of skills and knowledge we develop, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially, any aspect of your organization can be somehow categorized and attributed to any of these uh, categories. All right. I hope that uh, on the high level, it's quite um, understandable. Um, but now the question, where's the culture? I, I trust many of you uh, already heard about uh, this saying uh, that uh, culture is a strategy for breakfast, yeah? But where's the culture? And the culture is the result of applying a specific organizational design uh, inside your organization. Of course, um, some people in the organization, for instance, the CEO and the board, they might design the organization. Yeah, They decide on all these aspects. And their culture is, of course, something that has a critical impact on those decisions. But other people who do not decide, but maybe influence or maybe influence quite a little uh, these decisions, the culture of these people uh, is uh, tremendously impacted by what type of the organization we have in place. So you, have, you can find a lot of different uh, quotes on the internet, uh, but the key point of this is just to say that culture is crucial, but you cannot directly change the culture. You need to always, if you want to make a cultural shift, you need to first of all address the drivers residing inside your organizational design. So now the second, um, the second um, foundation for Orca tool was the iceberg model of the system thinking. And when we come to the Orca uh, canvas, I will show you how these two can be combined and uh, how you can use them in practice together. So the iceberg model uh, is, uh, yeah, by the way, uh, <laughs> It's it's pity, but uh, honestly, I tried to find uh, who is the author of Iceberg Model. And if you're familiar with Iceberg Model and know who is the author, well, I, I would appreciate a lot if you could uh, let us know because, uh, yeah, it's so powerful and so a useful tool, but who was the uh, one? Uh, nobody knows, unfortunately. So the Iceberg Model uh, explains that when we uh, see something uh, happening, this is just the surface of uh, the uh, bigger system. On the surface, we have an event, but behind this event, you will uh, you might discover that there's a pattern or a trend. 
So this is also somewhere maybe uh, a little bit above or already uh, below the surface. But when you go deeper into un identifying the drivers for creating these patterns and trends, you will discover that a lot is hidden and this is on the level of structure. So speaking about the organizational design, yeah? So speaking about the organizational design, we can say that these four elements, structures, processes, rewards, and people, you can always try to identify on this level of uh, structure, speaking of uh, the iceberg model. And finally, uh, people uh, design these structures or design their organization, um, of course, based on their mental models. So mental models uh, are, yeah, you 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 develop your mental mental model based on your experience. So it's quite hard to even try to change it, just uh, convincing people, because they have a lot of background and uh, quite a lot of mental models are very strong, and uh, some diff some approaches exist to change the model mental model of people, but the most powerful is to. Uh, give them experience. So this is why experiments, um, they can help you a lot. So for example, if your uh, top management disagrees with your proposals, then you can uh, advise, what if we try something um, with low risk and you will see how it works. They can gain the new experience and change their mindset. So um, now just a simple example, which we will use uh, going on. Uh, this is, uh, again, the very simplified example from uh, my personal practice. Uh, on the level of events, there was a discovery that an important and relatively simple customer feature took three months. Yeah, so <laughs> it means that uh, everyone agreed that uh, it's not a big deal, but three months of work, how it happened. So when they tried to analyze any patterns and trends, they discovered that actually most features needed several teams to deliver their pieces. And these teams did it sequentially. And each time it took quite long waiting time between um, tackling these uh, features by different teams. So that was something discovered uh, and can be attributed to uh, patterns. Um, on the other hand, when uh, the company tried to look deeper inside, they identified that teams were cross-functional. Yeah, well, probably good, maybe not, I don't know. But uh, they were assigned by management to kind of own a separate set of components so that no other teams could change these components uh, except for just the component owner team. Yeah. So they discovered that this was one of the drivers of creating these patterns. Another driver was that um, usually uh, features needed to cross the areas of ownership of more than one team. Well, maybe even without that, the first one would not be a problem. Who knows? Uh, finally, they discovered that each team worked with their own product owner managing, of course, own backlog. So that was the discovery about that company. And uh, when uh, these people tried to identify why these organizational uh, solutions uh, appeared, they discovered that there were two beliefs. First one uh, was about, um, well, the uh, management believed that high quality of technical solutions requires clear ownership by a single team. Why? Just because when everyone is responsible, nobody is responsible. That was the belief of the top management. Another belief was that uh, according to Scrum, scaling Scrum requires that multiple teams uh, work with their own product owners and respectively with own product backlog. So that was the belief of uh, inside this company. Now let's look how we can use exactly this example and apply it in uh, the Orca canvas. And what is the Orca canvas uh, at all? 
So before we go into this, I wanted to show you this picture because I just like nature and uh, uh, this shows you the iceberg itself, but also it shows you the uh, orca. And the whole idea of orca is that you can look uh, above the surface, but you always go deep, deep enough to identify everything that is hidden. So you collaborate to discover and analyze the hidden here. Okay, orca. Dennis, uh, I'll just jump in there. Is yes. that uh, of course you shall receive? Uh, mm -hmm. Mark Florett has basically given you that answer. Is is that uh, Edward Hall in 1970 had basically created the iceberg model? Wow, that's amazing. The, to me personally, it's it, it's it's an achievement. C is it possible to just uh, put the exact name if uh, if you can into the chat so that yeah, I, I will definitely use it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot. Amazing. Thank you. Cool. Um, okay. So Orca Canvas. Well, let me put it straightforward, guys. This is not, not a big invention. This is just that we structurized and combined two tools inside one. And we uh, identified how we can go step by step uh, using these tools in order to um, identify root causes and even more. So let me show you this. So we start uh, on this canvas, we start from the top. Each step is uh, numbered. So you can see that the first one is the, about the organization. And as soon as, well, I'm just sharing our own experience because we, together with Ralph, we use this tool and you can use it too, uh, without any problems. So uh, as soon as we uh, quite often uh, work with different companies, of course, we want <laughs> this company to be uh, in the title. But uh, sometimes we discovered that even different departments might have different considerations. And this is why you can place here, not just the organization, but maybe a specific department where you have um, some, some discussions happening, okay? So in this example, we use one uh, FinTech company. This is one of my recent uh, engagements. Um, next, on the level of event, we ask a question, what is the event uh, that you want to analyze? And yeah. As you remember, probably in the previous uh, on the previous uh, section, we looked at the event that an important and relatively simple product change took three months. Yeah, so this is the event. Next, this event uh, was actually behind this event. We discovered that most features pass through a sequence of many team backlogs, in each of which they spend several sprints while actual work takes a little fraction of the overall time yeah so essentially just a little work right but uh the features go um through sequence of many team backlogs yeah this is the essence of this and another pattern uh which was behind that pattern so uh, that was exactly the way of thinking inside this uh company that for most customer-centric features, more than one team needs to be involved. So I could say that even if you have um, uh, teams uh, working uh, on different backlogs, but your features do not need to uh, cross the boundaries of these backlogs, probably that would not be that huge impact. But here you can see that customer-centric features um, uh, required more than one team to be involved. So that was a discovery on the level of trends and patterns. Next, let's look deeper. Let me remove this. So on the level of organizational design, first of all, uh, they discovered that uh, priorities for teams are set in their own separate backlogs. Yeah, so essentially they worked with uh, different backlogs. Um, because of that, essentially, sh shouldn't it, it be in place? Probably there was would not be this uh, a pattern and respectively uh, much less uh, dramatic consequences on the level of events. Each team had their own product owner. Well, quite quite often I discovered that uh, organizations have this. Uh, and this company thought that exactly because of having these uh, prescribed by the company, yeah, okay, I'm a product owner. How can I 
do my work if I do not uh, place a product backlog, my own product backlog in place for this specific team. Of course, they did that. Um, on the other hand, uh, for the second pattern, they uh, identified this driver uh, that each team is assigned to own specific set of components. Uh, so in this case, that was about the architectural components like backend, uh, different types of front end, middle layer, etc. And the most important that they connected to this uh, defining that most customer-centric features need the changes in components owned by the different teams. So the customer feature needed front-end, middle layer, and back-end, for example. So that was, a, yes, of course, <laughs> believe me that this is quite simplified uh, picture because they uh, dig deeper into this and discovered uh, a lot of other uh, causes of these causes. So they tried to find the real root causes, but for the sake of this explanation, um, this, is, this is it for now. Um, now I would like to uh, show you these um, uh, steps. Yeah, so I introduce you this on uh, using the practical example, but you can find all the steps uh, described here on the canvas itself. And uh, one last uh, comment here says that actually, even after this fourth step, after uh, di um, discovering the organizational design elements, um, contributing to uh, having these uh, outcomes, you can already have quite important uh, information to work with. But if you, uh, if you identify that you want to discover something deeper and you want to analyze not just a static snapshot, which is this one, yeah? So this is kind of how it is right now, but you want to analyze the dynamics of your system, then uh, yes, of course, we encourage you to go further and uh, uh, convert these uh, aspects into the variables of the system uh, system thinking and uh, use the tool, for instance, the CLD or causal loop diagramming, uh, which helps you to um, discuss and identify much more on the dynamic side. So you can discover uh, relationships uh, which change with time, relationships between different uh, elements. Unfortunately, the CLD itself and the systems thinking is a huge topic, of course. So this is not the topic for this small event, but you can quite easily uh, convert this into the CLD. And in the end, I will show you example of that. So right now, what I suggest you to try is to use this example, absolutely the same, um, aspects already are in place, but there are uh, six, if I'm not mistaken, six other um, aspects and patterns, trends, uh, which were also discovered by this company. So uh, I will share with you uh, them right now. And what I will ask you, if you want, of course, to try to apply your own experience, your, of course, your own mindset, and try to think what could be the um, cause-effect relations between these uh, components so that you could place these um, aspects onto the uh, Orca canvas and discuss between you. Okay, so we will do this uh, already right now. Just give me a second. But first, I will introduce you exactly these missing so far elements. So uh, first of all, can you see my screen so far? All good? Yeah, if you could zoom in a little bit more, it might be easier to read. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Now good? Okay, cool. So what we will try to do, uh, we will try to enrich the example, uh, which we discussed before. And uh, uh, first one is uh, the this discovery that people prefer not to help each other, even when needed for a high priority work. Yeah, I, just a hint. Probably this is about some behavioral patterns, yeah? So just a hint. Um, next one here, people's performance depends on the KPIs set by single functional line management. 
So performance meaning, uh, I don't know if you don't know familiar, uh, are not familiar with this, uh, people's salaries and uh, maybe even bonuses uh, quite often connected to some performance. Even when not connected, then performance is some official procedure and uh, kind of annually, uh, your manager is together with you in one-to-one -one and they tell you how well you work, yeah? So this is a sort of a quite uh, standard performance process. So uh, what your manager will tell you and how much your salary can raise, um, this depends on the uh, KPIs set by single functional line manager. So this is their discovery. Okay, next one. Uh, hiring. Uh, hiring process focuses on a single narrow specialization and it ignores secondary skills of candidates by which they actually could also effectively contribute to team's results. So that company was uh, software development uh, predominantly because the uh, FinTech um, company produced some software product. And... Uh, here, uh, you can look at this as uh, uh, hiring was uh, for front-end developers, back-end developers, quality assurance specialists, analysts, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah? And uh, they um, ignored the fact that quite often uh, people had secondary skills, much less, of course, less uh, developed, but still uh, with those skills, people could uh, help their teams uh, bring value uh, to uh, their team achievements. So next one, um, standard workflow prescribed a sequential process with individual responsibility for each step according to the people's narrow specialization. So just to put it uh, practically, uh, those front-end and uh, back-end developers they produced some code, then they passed it to the QA guys. QA guys checked the code, well, the functionality, and if they found some bugs, they get it back to developers. So it was step by step. When, when everything is good, maybe they passed it to DevOps guys or some guys who, who were responsible for deployment and so on and so forth. So this is just an example. Okay, next, uh, they discovered that people in truly cross-functional teams still worked solely on tasks relevant to their, their still a single narrow specialization. Yeah, so front-end developers work, worked only on the tasks relevant to front-end development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Even when they actually suf could sufficiently help by um, contributing to other tasks because they still had their secondary skills. So quite often front-end developers have some background in back-end, back-end developers some background in front-end, but even if not, then they quite often can test their own uh, code or the code of others. DevOps is quite often uh, actually um, the uh, capability of developers and even QA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But in this case of this company, no. Yeah, I can do this, but I stick to my um, narrow specialization. And final one, careers and salaries of people in teams uh, were attached to their single narrow specialization. So as you can see, uh, almost everything here is about this topic, yeah, narrow specialization. And uh, lastly, the careers and salaries were attached to exactly those. So people... Uh, could not get a career promotion in uh, just because they uh, uh, gain a next level in um, backend development while they are front end developers, for example. Yeah, or if they mastered quite well um, uh, testing, they they would not get promoted uh, or get raised in salary because they are just backend developers, for example. So um, now these six you have. And uh, what we will do, you will have these number of the, uh, these um, panels are the same. And uh, please, um, now you will be uh, distributed into uh, breakout rooms, okay? And uh, uh, when uh, you uh, are in the breakout room, you will have a number of this breakout room. So please find your 
uh, respective um, board. And uh, below or above the uh, board, you will find these six elements, okay? So what you need to do is to take one, oh, let me do it, yeah? Take one, place it into the respective place on the orca canvas. So if this one is about uh, trends and patterns, probably you place it somewhere here and connect by arrow if you believe that it could have any impact on the already existing other patterns, trends, or even directly to the event, and so on and so forth. So if this is something belonging to the organizational design, place it somewhere here and connect by arrows. So arrow represents a cause-effect relation. Uh, we will have, um, how much time we have? Uh, 15 minutes, 20, 20, right? I think we can do 20. Yeah. Is that, is that good? Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, you will have, um, a timer and, uh, time to time we will join, uh, different backout rooms to help you if any, if, if any questions, uh, about the task. Okay. So let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll open up the breakout rooms unless anyone's got a quick question. I think we're good to go. All right, I'll open up seven rooms. Where are you moving from? Portugal. Portugal. Mm -hmm. Nice. <laughs> yeah, look, I think we've got everyone back again. Uh, sorry if that was a bit abrupt. Uh, it was like a 15 second countdown and I think we ended a little bit before the 20 minutes. But uh, yeah, let's see what we can make of what we just did, I guess. Uh, hand it back over to Dennis. Yeah, so thank you a lot for everyone uh, for trying this out. Uh, it's always amazing to see how people first time seeing this. And, and this is quite hard because you never tried something like that before. I completely appreciate this, but you still tried it. I appreciate your efforts for sure. So now I will share not the correct answer. There's no uh, good or bad answer here, obviously, but this is just what the company from which I took this example, what they managed to come to, you know? And again, this is of course simplified, but using these uh, specific aspects, they connected this way. So their belief was that uh, because the people preferred not to help each other, it um, uh, created the pattern that in each team, quite simple and uh, sort of short work uh, took uh, several sprints. Yeah. Well, hey, Dennis. So, sorry, can you share your screen, please? Uh, do you do you mean I I do not? Okay. Can you see right now my screen? It's coming. Many thanks. Thank you. Oh, okay. So apologies for that. Um. So um. Below uh, below the board where you worked, this long one. Yeah. You can find the example version. And uh, here it is. So <clears throat> people not helping each other, that was uh, kind of a cause of uh, another pattern that, that is in the center. And that was also driven by the fact that people in truly cross-functional teams, despite the fact that uh, on the team they had all the needed functions, but the people were narrowly specialized. yeah, And uh, they uh, preferred to work exactly on that specialization uh, front end, back end, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, on the side of organizational design, other four elements, they exactly, they created this uh, pattern, this behavioral pattern of people. So what uh, uh, dr drove people towards that pattern? First of all, uh, people's performance dependent on their KPIs set by narrowly specialized function managers. So essentially what it meant that there was a front end development manager and they, they said, okay, look, I, I don't, I cannot even estimate, uh, evaluate how well you worked uh, in terms of testing and uh, other uh, functions. I need something about the front end. Show me, show me, you know? <laughs> uh, and uh, the same about QA guys, despite the fact that they tried sometimes, they tried to, uh, do some analysis. They uh, QA guys are quite good in analysis, but 
when they came to this uh, evaluation, they discovered that this is not valued by the company. So they just stopped doing this. Uh, on the other hand, uh, quite quite connected to performance was the careers and salaries. So they was they were quite in line between each other. So uh, when a front end guy wanted to have uh, some promotion, uh, the only way was to proceed developing as a front end. Any development in other functions did not help him at all. Um, hiring focused on the same essentially, you know. And uh, finally, even the workflow, which was prescribed, so it required that you hand over from one function to another, from front end to uh, QA to um, DevOps and analysis somewhere in, in the beginning of this uh, flow, et cetera, et cetera. So this was the discovery of this company. Again, maybe this is not the case about other companies, but this is how they uh, identify this. So now what they did further, they said that, look, but we want to uh, understand the dynamics of this. And they built the CLD, uh, the causal loop diagram. So what they did therefore, they took all of these cards, they translated them into the system variables yeah, unfortunately, again, uh, the limited time of this session uh, does not allow me to explain what's the difference. But when you learn about the causal loop diagrams, you will identify that this is not a rocket science to actually translate these uh, cards into variables. And then you do not just connect these um, variables, but you express whether this connection is... Uh, direct or opposite, whether there's any strong connection or weak connection, whether you have any delay uh, in the uh, cause effect. And moreover, here you can find those um, um, something belonging to the mental models. For example, they identified that there was this belief that high company performance required strengthening of control and functional performance within product development. So that was a cornerstone, actually, from their perspective, because it drove some pressure on management to strengthen control, pressure on management to strengthen functional performance, and it led to other um, uh, variables changing in the respective direction. So the uh, more pressure to strengthen, for instance, control, uh, the more they focused on having each team with uh, own product owners with own uh, team backlogs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, again, guys, uh, I apologize for giving you a simplified model because it's it's kind of aggregation, uh, higher level aggregation of numerous other uh, more detailed variables. And of course, it's not that much readable even right now. Without context, it's, it's quite hard to read. So I appreciate this. But uh, the purpose of this is to show that this is quite possible to easily step up from just a static view of the, the system that you can get from the previous steps into much more thorough and dynamic consideration of your systems, if you need that. And by the way, um, uh, we agreed with uh, guys that uh, I will prepare some uh, sort of a PDF and I will post it on some share so that share drive so that uh, you will have a link to it and you can always uh, come back and look and maybe even analyze this if you want. So uh, in the bottom, for example, you can find the summary of the system dynamics analysis uh, as a result of analysis of this uh, diagram. Yeah, so unfortunately, <laughs> the limited time does not allow us to, to look at it. By the way, uh, one hint, after this session, until uh, tomorrow's uh, end of the day, I will keep uh, the link open so you can uh, come back and you can, uh, if you want, browse around and you know uh, read all of this. So I hope that it will help you. So you even can make a screenshot if you want. If it, it it will work better for you. So uh, this is it. Again, unfortunately, I cannot give uh, much more uh, explanation, which uh, would help you to uh, understand even uh, better. But anyways, I definitely will admire and appreciate your feedback. So. Could you please uh, tell me just uh, two uh, two aspects? Yeah, how well do you understand the Orca canvas right now, and how valuable 
it might be for you or your uh, co-workers. Um, please take one card and place on the scale somewhere according to these uh, labels, yeah. Let's do it just quickly because uh, this is for, probably not for you, but for me. But anyways, I, I will be be very very uh, uh, grateful for this. Any color. All right, thank you a lot. So I uh, definitely see the distribution. And honestly, uh, after previous uh, session that we gave uh, together with, uh, <laughs> with my partner in, in Europe, uh, uh, this is much better. So <laughs> we improved this time and this is the key learning for me. And also we are going to prepare a sort of a white paper which will be published free uh, for everyone to use and it will give much more explanations about the tool. So now the time of Q&A. So if you have time and you have interest in the Q&A, then uh, let's do it. Uh, do we have any questions already, um, Derek? Okay, so uh, before we kick off this segment, uh, folks uh, on the call, round of applause. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much. Yay. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks to everyone for participating too. Okay, so folks, uh, so uh, as I mentioned is, uh, could I get you to tee up any of your questions in the chat? Uh, but if you have anything burning right now that uh, you've already uh, thought of, the floor is yours to, to start it off. So do I have anyone so brave? Uh, hi guys, uh, this is Mark. Hello, Mark. Hello. Yes, we can hear uh, you, Mark. Uh, yeah. You're so, uh, th thanks for sharing the the canvas. At least for me. So I, I didn't. So I, I knew about the theory. This is why I shared the the name of the author, but I haven't used the canvas. Uh, question: Because I felt that it was kind of forcing me uh, to to do a, a double loop or double jump to think about the concepts and to put them in the right uh, section, if it was a pattern or behavior. So thinking that you have created the, the causal loop diagram uh, beside the, cam the ORCID uh, canvas, would you recommend or advise to start with the causal loop diagram? And then once you have a clear mapping to try to put them into the ORCA canvas, or do you recommend to do the other way around. So canvas first and then CLD. Yeah, uh, Mark, thank you. Thank you a lot for this, uh, this question. Uh, it's really good that you uh, uh, have it. So um, just, just to make it clear that the exercise that we had, it was not that much uh, about the using from the beginning, the Orca canvas, because you already kind of in the middle of the process. You already have something and you needed to uh, enrich it. Uh, but uh, when you um, only start thinking about some event, some problem or opportunity, and you you, you want to discover the uh, what, uh, what are the drivers, the hidden drivers for that, then the suggestion is to start exactly with Orca Canvas and why. Let me explain this. So first of all, uh, you will go uh, from the uh, obvious on the surface, the events and probably some patterns, trends, and go deeper. So the deeper you go, uh, the uh, the more um, effort it uh, requires to think from uh, different perspectives. And this is exactly what we discovered because we previously we tried to use uh, just the iceberg model. And when you reach the level of the structures, so the level of organizational design here is the level of structures in, in the um, iceberg model. Uh, when we reach that level, we discover that it's so broad and you, can in, you cannot even um, identify the way how to approach it. But when we combined it with the four elements of the organizational design, what it gave us, it gave, gave us uh, perspectives from which you can look. 
So what uh, what you do here? So for example, um, yeah, I'm showing on the screen. So uh, if you're interested, you can you can look at it. So uh, if you have this event, and if you already discovered some patterns behind this event, which are kind of on the surface or close to it. Then you can ask yourself a question. If you even struggle with um, approaching the next step, yeah, then you can ask yourself, look, okay, speaking about the structures, or maybe you can start with processes. So speaking about processes, do we have anything that uh, might lead us to having these uh, patterns? And narrowing the focus helped us and uh, our other practitioners with whom we tried this kind of uh, in a natural way from the beginning, taking the real example, we discovered that narrowing the focus of the group helped us to uh, ideate much more effectively. So this is the ideation because you don't know right away. And if you ask yourself about processes, they ask themselves about processes and they discovered that uh, on the side of priorities, uh, because every process works according to priorities and priorities were set by separate backlogs. So it means that teams did not have any other choice, but just follow that uh, priority in a separate backlog. It sounds obvious, but we suggest that uh, even something obvious you place because it gives you the next step or grounds to proceed further on. Something quite obvious, closer to surface, gives you the opportunity to think about deeper levels. So this is what they did. They placed it, yeah, but this obvious, let's put it. So they did it and they said, okay, on the level of processes, we don't know anything else right now. On the level of structures, and they identified that, what about roles and responsibilities? Well, actually we have a product owner role and we do not prescribe that each team has their own backlog. What we prescribe that each team has a product owner. So actually, because of exactly that, they discovered that each team had their product backlogs. Probably it sounds obvious, but unless you change uh, your perspective here and you start questioning, are we sure that each team needs their own product backlog? Maybe they need a com common backlog and common product owner, perhaps. They started questioning this and they discovered a lot of other stuff. We did not put it here, but in that case, they discovered that on the level of mental models, uh, there was assumption, uh, there was a belief that Scrum prescribes having a product owner for each team when a single product is developed by multiple teams. When they address this question to the uh, professional Scrum trainer, they advise, hey guys, well, actually, no, <laughs> this is a um, um, misconception. So if your design is based on just that rule, then you based it on misconception. So that was a kind of something like discovery for them. So uh, short answer to your question is that uh, we've, well, of course you can use it any way you want. If you go directly into the CLD, probably you even don't need the Orca canvas. But what Orca canvas gives you is the um, different perspectives of looking at your organizational system and deeper uh, the opportunity to ideate on it when you are not that much familiar with the organizational design itself. To me personally, well, despite the fact that I'm dealing with the organizational design for uh, years already, but when I speak to the top management, I discover that unfortunately top management are not that much familiar with the organizational design. They just do based on their own experience in other companies, just copy pasting this organizational design. And I discovered that when I start uh, from something simple, and Orca Canvas gives you exactly the simpler way of discussing things. Uh, CLD is quite complex, just to put it straightforward. You need to really understand how to do it, what does it mean, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, for previous steps gives you the opportunity to simplify the approach to your management. And when you catch them in terms of their interests, they discover something already, Sometimes it's already right now enough because in this case they discovered that they were they had a misconception. Yeah, 
But in other aspects, they wanted to go further. That was not enough. They had a lot of disagreement. And then they jumped into the CLD. But that, that required a separate training, unfortunately. Mark, did I answer your question? Yes, Dennis, many thanks for, for the for the advice and and the detailed answer. No yeah, worries. Cool. Thank you for the question. So Dennis, we've got a, a question from Bindu uh, in regards to the example that you use. So Bindu, are you there? Yep. Uh, can I repeat, sorry? Yep. Bindu, the, the floor is yours. Okay. I, I was so curious because like most of the issues that like we had on the board were like things that I have in my organization. So I was just curious as an example, like, so once you did this um, Orca canvas, uh, can you, I think you already mentioned an example when you said about the product teams, but uh, what are the other things that happened as a result of uh, doing this canvas to solve for some of the issues that we've noticed? Yeah. So, um, so I, I, I'm always trying to be honest. Um, uh, this specific example was in the company that I worked with as a, as a freelancer, as a consultant. And uh, uh, in my practice, quite rarely uh, companies uh, trust consultant that much. So they prefer getting some advice, but they want logic behind that. So uh, after uh, doing this exercise, uh, what I got, I got uh, definitely the interest in learning more and deeper. So management understood that their mental model uh, probably hinders them from uh, changing their culture because they identified that, you see, some of these patterns are quite behavioral, right? So this is about the culture. And as I said, this is a simplified model. So there were much more uh, discoveries about the behaviors of people. And they discovered that uh, the topic that they did not even think about previously, the organizational design, is much deeper. And what I got as a result, I got uh, uh, the request for deeper analysis and ultimately, of course, a training on the organizational design, et cetera, et cetera. Some, well, again, uh, I'm speaking about my network. In some companies, uh, managers already have some experience about the designing the organization, not just copy pasting it, because when you copy paste, you copy paste all the um, all the weaknesses, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, they uh, discovered that this gives the, they the opportunity to have a shared understanding. So from my perspective, whatever tool you take, just this canvas or CLD itself or any other tool, uh, the most important is that you can collaboratively discuss and can discover differences in your mental models. So even in this example, I uh, got uh, several managers who said, no, I don't believe that this aspect has this cause effect relation with that aspect. And we did, we had a quite fruitful discussion about that. So we went deeper, of course, that, uh, led us to um, uh, digging inside these cause relations. And uh, we discovered that just because of our different experience, they don't believe that that, uh, that cause-effect relation exists. Then now, for me personally, this is the most valuable sign. You cannot change, as I started with, you cannot change the opinion of people who have completely different uh, experience and that is the main driver for their beliefs. What you can do is to propose them. If they have a doubt that maybe we don't know everything, you can propose them to have an experiment. And this is exactly what we did. So we did, we, we took some uh, little part of this organization. We... Uh, kind of separated it uh, into kind of uh, narrow, uh, but deep enough so that the whole organizational, uh, all organizational elements would be involved. And we tried to transform this organization, a little part of the organization, I mean, uh, and that learning gave them this experience and they could ultimately, I would not say that uh, fully change their mind, but uh, continuously change their mind during the next consequent 
subsequent uh, um, attempts to change uh, broader uh, part of the organization. Thank you, Dennis. I think you articulated that really well. Oh, thank you a lot for your question. Okay, so just checking the time, this is probably going to be our last one, and it's got a couple of layers, which it's uh, it's is an interesting one. Large organizations, uh, command control, a different focus with the organization. So, Jack, uh, are you there? Uh, floor is yours. Yeah, I was just saying, it's like I work for a very large um, organization, and the concept of this to understand where the problems lie is, is good. But how does the business and the entire how does the business and management actually go about adopting or recognizing that they need to do something like this um, to help build things? Like I've got a project that's been going on for eight months, and it probably should only take a month, but it, it doesn't because of various reasons, which were all mentioned on this on the board previously. So, what's your advice to um, help get or change the culture in the first place to adopt this sort of strategy. Yeah, ch uh, change the culture. Um, I trust there are two, <laughs> again, honestly speaking, I trust there are two uh, maturity levels of uh, the decision makers on management side, I mean, the top managers, those who already understand that uh, <laughs> culture drives your organization and uh, culture is strategy for breakfast, uh, and those who do not. <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, even uh, out of those who understand this, um, quite few really recognize that you actually can um, drive the cultural change. You cannot directly change the culture, but you can drive the cultural change through changing the organizational design. So this is exactly uh, the topic of the course that I'm giving, for example, how you can change the organization in order to change the culture. And um, yeah, so for example, <laughs> my quote is uh, that structure, it's culture for lunch. So if culture is strategy for breakfast, structure it's culture for lunch. And if you um, want to attempt uh, um, uh, to convince your management uh, about the uh, organizational change, I always suggest not to start, start uh, straightforward, okay, let's change it. But you need to really uh, make absolutely obvious the problem, okay, do we believe that we have that problem, that this project, for, for example, quite simple, takes ages, yeah? Yes, we agree. Now, do we know why it happens? And you go into these uh, trans patterns, what you see in the behaviors of people, what you see in terms of events, is it is it kind of one off that this project is so long? Maybe it's just uh, an attribute of this project or this is kind of uh, always happening or even worsening, you know? Then you are on the say on the level of trend, trends and patterns. You can even forget about the orca canvas. But if you go this way, little by little, deepening your um, consideration and leading the discussion with your managers, I suggest you always visualize. So if you visualize, you are on the same page because the deeper you go, the more complex is the discussion. So this is why we actually use this tool because it helps you to visualize and have a structure uh, of your discussion. So when you visualize, always try to check if what you draw and others draw is the same way understood by people. And uh, only then the picture that you um, draw here uh, is uh, kind of agreed between you. But sometimes you will discover that already right now on the first, second step, you disagree. Then you go deeper. You say, okay, I think that there is this connection, but if we look deeper into this connection between these two aspects, there are some other aspects. So ac actually the same approach is used in the causal loop diagramming. But if you work with managers who are not that familiar with CLD and you don't want to jump into the more complex approach, you can do it here. So for example, you can say that, okay, you disagree with this connection that uh, um, each team is assigned to own specific set of product uh, components and um, uh, components are uh, such define, defined in a way that uh, features cross many components. 
that it leads us to this pattern, you disagree, then lo let's look at this deeper. Between these, you will discover some other elements. And uh, when you go deeper and deeper, you identify the exact point, not that abstract, but exact point when you disagree. And you can either, first, you can work with this somehow, how you can work with this if you have more powerful managers or other opinions that these managers trust. Or you can uh, say that, yeah, okay, what if we uh, do the experiment, as I said. But the most important, if you see that there's a misagreement uh, about some specific aspect and you cannot change it because of the different uh, my uh, yeah experiences, you know that this is maybe not your battle. Try to find other points where you can uh, make the point and you can catch the attention. So in, in one of my uh, previous experiences, uh, even before uh, inventing this uh, Orca canvas, uh, using just a uh, uh, iceberg model, uh, I discovered that it was just impossible to uh, change the mindset of people about some specific aspects. So we changed, with my partner, we changed to other aspects. We gained the understanding and agreement there. So we started some experiments and we showed based on those experiments how exactly those patterns that they disagreed with, they changed because of changing those elements. So various approaches exist, but uh, this is a huge topic. <laughs> I, I'm giving even the whole three-day uh, course about that. And uh, honestly, it's it's not enough to really go that deep. So still you need to learn after that. So unfortunately, I cannot give you all the advice here. No, I appreciate that, Dennis, and you've given some good insights for me to think about and, and go back with. The Thank you a lot for your going to change. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah. That note is uh, we've uh, concluded our Q and A time. Uh, back over to you, uh, uh, Rowan. Yeah, look, uh, just on that last topic too. Um, I think there's a great summary from a friend of ours, Cesario Ramos, right? Who said, "I'm not in the convincing business. I'm in the understanding business." At least that's the way I remember him saying it. Basically, and I think that's a really lovely way to look at what Dennis has shared with us in this session, right? That you know, if we can just say, hey, let's explore what we're thinking is behind the scenes of what's going on around here, then hopefully we can build more understanding. And from there, we get potentially uh, people reconsidering some of their decisions or their current structures and potentially some way forward on it. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So thanks. Yeah, let's thank Dennis once again. Thank you so much. Thank you a lot for this opportunity. Thank you for taking the time to do this. And yeah, as you may have heard, yeah, Dennis is not just interested in uh, spending more time in Australia, but maybe interested in uh, sharing a lot more depth on this on a training course. So yeah, Dennis, I guess you can uh, share a link if you've got some expression of interest, I think you're trying to do, is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, uh, right now I'm just collecting the uh, interests of um, to participate in this course. So uh, you can uh, please use this link if you are interested and you can express your interest here. Just give me a second. It's not that straightforward. We can share it on meetup.com as well so people can see it after just now. Yeah. yeah. So it's on my website. And uh, uh, of course, you can just connect with me. We can uh, chat. Uh, so you you can request some consultancy if you if you want. Uh, but the main point is that um, please keep in mind that transparency in Scrum is not only for Scrum. Transparency is the basis for everything. And this is what Cesario uh, speak about. And this is the uh, uh, fundamental root cause of all the problems in the organization, the lack of transparency. So our tool is exactly about making transparency for, for complex discussions. Great. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, we'll let you know what's coming up next month, but uh, in the meantime, take care and see you soon. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dennis.